Uh, we're going live. Okay, I think we're live. Hello, everybody. It's Uncle Grumpy and Dr. Pasternak. Let's see if we're on here first before we get too far into this. Oh, there we go. I think we're live. Let me turn this down. Yep, we are live. All right, let's change the setting. Make a side-by-side. -side. Let me see here. Well, hello, everybody. Hopefully, you're having a good Friday night. I don't think we're going to take up too much of your time. Let's see. All right, there we go. Lawrence, how is your Friday going? We'll spend a good share of the day working on a paper. Um, Playing with my what dog. Are you, what are you working on now? What what paper? Um, there's a German publisher, uh, De Greuter. They uh, publish um, the main German journal for Kant studies, Kant Studien, and uh, they have a um, collection on proofs for God's existence in Kant, his arguments against some of the standard uh, proofs, and then Kant's own proof. And so I'm doing a chapter on Kant 1791 on the miscarriage of all philosophical trials and theodicy. Really? So just a little light writing then? Nothing yeah. too heavy? Yeah. <laughs> all right, I'm trying to share this to a couple places real quick. See if we can get the word out. Yeah, I see some people joining Pamela Deb. That's great. If you guys want to talk to us, we'll read your questions or see what you have to say here. Okay, a couple more I need to hit deliberately. There we go. All right, so, Lawrence, uh, we're not going to take up too much time. I don't think we'll do an hour. I'm not sure we have that much to talk about, but we do have uh, something that is important, and that is that... Today was the uh, final day for filing for bills, and so, or at least to file for a position for a bill. So, uh, in other words, just about every lawmaker came up with eight titles of bills that they may or may not be running this year, and they submitted those by today, and that gives them a place in the running to get their bill heard. Um, and so this is when some of the well, I don't want to. Let's, this is when some. This is when everything is thrown at the wall, and they wait to see what st what sticks, and then they put more work into that. So, and in that in that um, thinking, they put forward this bill that we're here to talk about today. So, Lawrence, why don't you tell us what bill this is, who the author is? and what you seem to think the intent of this bill might be, what our conclusions might be here. Representative Olson um, from Salisaw, I believe Salisaw is right near the Arkansas border. Um, yeah, it it's is. It's House Bill, House Bill 2779. And the core thing that this bill does is it further restricts where cannabis businesses may be located. Um, namely, um, no retail marijuana establishment um, may be located within 1,000 feet of any place of worship. And the def definition of a place of worship is any permanent building structure, facility, or office space owned, leased, rented, or borrowed on a full-time basis when used for worship services, activities, and business of the congregation, which may include but not limited to churches, temples, synagogues, and mosques, as well as um, any permanent um, building structure, facility, or office space owned, leased, rented, or borrowed for the use on a temporary basis when used for worship services, activities, and businesses of the congregation, which may include but not be limited to churches, temples, synagogues, and mosques. So imagine a mosque which temporarily rents out an office space in order to conduct some specific item of business. Well, no cannabis establishment can be within a thousand square feet of that. 
It's not even a permanent church. It could just be a business office that's there temporarily. So that's pretty darn extraordinary. So, so you know, it, it doesn't, it, so wait, so you're saying it doesn't even have to be uh, the church itself, but it could be the office space rented by the church at any yeah. given facility? Right. So, I mean, I haven't done the map on that, but I'm guessing that would, if that was retroactive, that would eliminate every dispensary in Oklahoma. Yeah, so it's it's not retroactive. It says re retail marijuana businesses established prior to November 1, 2020, which do not conform to the distance requirement provided in this subsection, shall be authorized to continue operating in their current locations. So it, it doesn't shut out any of the existing businesses, but basically it says no further businesses could establish themselves within a thousand feet of of any space that's used permanent or temporarily for any activities whatsoever related to a church, temple, synagogue, or mosque. Okay, but it doesn't say that they'll renew that license. It says any licensed facility, current licensed facility, will be allowed to continue to, to operate. It doesn't say they'll renew, do a renewal. Well, what it says is retail marijuana businesses that are established prior to as opposed to licensed prior to. So that means if you're physically located in that space, presumably you can continue on. And it won't, it, hypothetically, it won't impede re your renewal, but it could, you know, it could. That's something that the regulatory agency might act on. Sorry, excuse me one second. All right, go ahead. Sorry about that. So, you know, I, I don't see the language is clear enough here. So that in theory, the regulatory agency could say, we're not renewing any of the licenses for any of the establishments that violate this new statute. And, you know, you sort of would imagine basically every built up area in the entirety of the state of Oklahoma will have some sort of religious structure, temporary or permanent, you know, within a thousand square feet of one another, a thousand feet of one another. They're ubiquitous, right? Right. So I, there's other stuff in this bill, and and I'm curious. Was this? This looks like it was a trade. Um, if this reaffirms some of the language in the with the jobs issue, but then restricts the location of dispensaries, it seems like some kind of a bad trade here. What, am I seeing this wrong? Yeah, so yeah, so w when I first glanced at it a few days ago, I saw some language struck out. And I just saw that and my thought was, okay, they're actually doing two bad things. Not only are they restricting cannabis locations, but what they're also doing is they're taking away employee protections. That's what I thought I was wrong actually about that. Because instead what the author did was he struck the language that currently is in law having to do with employee protections, but then he reinserted it elsewhere. The rationale for it, I'm not too sure. It might just kind of clean it up in terms of presentation. But there's no substantial change in it with regards to the employee issue. Um, the, the substantial change only has to do with uh, the location for retail businesses. And, you know, the fact that it doesn't impact existing establishments, and hypothetically at least, it doesn't prevent those existing establishments from continuing on to exist indefinitely, then, you know, what does it really do? What it basically does, I, as, as I see it, is it's, it's, an ex, it's, it's an expression of an attitude. So, you know, when you think about what laws do, sometimes laws are meant to deter or to punish, but sometimes laws exist to kind of express an attitude, right? So, you know, there's things that practically speaking you can't enforce. Like, for instance, there used to be laws against infidelity, right? It used to be illegal, right? And so, hypothetically, it's not enforceable, but it expresses an attitude. And so, as I see it, what this bill does primarily is, is it expresses an attitude. And the attitude is that cannabis is against God's will. The plant that exists on this planet that bonds to receptors in our body to address medical conditions ranging from seizure disorders to inflammatory conditions to autoimmune conditions. This plant 
is against God's will. That, as I take it to be the expression being conveyed by this. Because if they don't want it near churches, the churches are basically saying, no, cannabis, we don't want you near us. Right, right. So like I was saying at the beginning, this being the uh, the last day to file bills, um, this one has more than just a title. This one has language. This is a yeah. something that's been well thought out. But this could possibly be as, uh, for example, there was a bill last year to allow the counties to vote to opt out of 788. Mm -hmm. And it never saw the light of day. We raised a bunch of cane about it. We made a bunch of phone calls as we needed to. And the person who wrote the bill immediately said, hey, wait, you know, I'm just doing this for a constituent. This is what they've asked me to run. I don't think it's got legs, but here it is. So perhaps that's this. Perhaps this doesn't have legs. Perhaps this doesn't see the floor. But I would venture to say that if we don't raise a stink about it, that it does. That if we well, sit back and do nothing, it'll just move forward. You know, here's here's an irony. There is there are a couple dozen churches of cannabis around the country. Cannabis churches. Some of them are, you know, officially established in their state as churches, properly filed for tax exempt status and so on. And so in theory, you could not have a cannabis church right. and a dispensary for cannabis within a thousand square feet of one another. And, and here in Oklahoma, there are cannabis churches that are run out of dispensaries. So what this is basically doing is it's saying your religion, your, your way of looking at cannabis as having religious significance, we deem unacceptable. And as I see it, that violates the First Amendment. Well, uh, you would know. I mean, this is religion is what you write about. This is your your area of expertise. So, well, 18th uh, century think, German philosophy of religion, but but still, well, yeah, close enough. I think you're hitting it hitting it on the the nail on the head here with what's going on. Um, people, I, I just go ahead. You know, pe there are people out there. You know, we know many of them who who see cannabis in a religious way, right? So, you know, yeah. classically, you know, a lot of believers, a lot of religious believers think that the world is created by God, that the order of nature is designed by God. There's something called the fine tuning argument, which has to do with just how detailed that organization is. We have endocannabinoid receptors in our body. This is a plant that bonds to those receptors that maintains homeostasis, that addresses inflammatory conditions and all those other things that you know we're familiar with. It addresses significant amounts of medical needs. So maybe, right, somebody who believes in God would say, look, right, the fact that this plant is able to do so much to help us is a is a sign of God. This plant's presence and its and its ability to work on our bodies as it does. For some people, they see this as bearing religious significance. People who might have turned away from the church, have turned away from religion, they might rediscover religion through cannabis. So and what let this me ask, bill is doing right. is... So let me, look, let me, with your knowledge, let me ask you some questions. But before we do that, someone's asking here, Sarah's asking, it, so I want to repeat this. This is House Bill 2779. Right. Okay, that's the, that's the bill we're talking about. House Bill 2779. And this is by Olson, is that right? Right. Am I pronouncing yeah. that right? I don't know the first name. It just says by Olson. I'm looking at the bill right now. Okay, so what I want to ask you, being a religious scholar here, can you help me understand why it is that the um, – because Olson. Oklahoma is such a religious-based state. I mean, this <clears throat> there's a reason why we say we're in the buckle of the Bible belt. Can you tell me why, and if there's one particular religion, and why they may have such a a view about this, and what's it based on, if anything? So, um, certain forms of Christianity, uh, baptism, perhaps most notoriously, uh, um, is ardently opposed to um, alcohol impairment, right? Mental impairment. And so the idea is, is that cannabis impairs you, so it's something that they find morally objectionable, right? So there's passages from the from Paul, you know, that 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 speak to the moral impropriety of impairment. 
And so those those are um, concepts that you know lie behind, for instance, the prohibitionist movement at the beginning of the twentieth century. And thus the thought is is that cannabis use basically is just impairing your cognition. Well, it's so much more complicated than that. First of all, this is a medical program. It's not a recreational program. And what this, what this bill is basically doing is saying, churches don't want you to use a plant God created to heal you, right? So look, they might say getting impaired is a bad thing. That's understandable. They express a moral attitude that way. But for them to say that we think that the state, the state, right, should enact laws to reflect our attitude that this plant should not be legally available near us. That's, as I see it, a violation of the First Amendment. Okay, so we have, as we've discussed in the past, we have the safety-sensitive jobs issue, which he, he addresses in here, but as we've said, it doesn't really change anything, just no. kind of reaffirms it. Right. Go ahead. Yeah. The, no. Safety sensitive. This is. This doesn't speak to safety sensitive. Seven eighty eight provided a blanket protection um, that uh, no adverse employment action be taken on the basis of having a card or testing positive for a metabolite. Right. And so then um, twenty six twelve undoes that for safety sensitive, but preserves it for um, the rest of employment. And okay. then what, what this bill does in earlier on in section one, I think, what this bill does in, in section, yeah, in section one is it amends the language from 788. And in a way that's not substantively significant, it basically just takes the language that says employees cannot basically uh, be denied employment and so on for this it cuts that and then it just puts it into a different spot. So it just changes the order of words around in the amending section. Okay, well, changing the order of words around can be a drastic change in what happens. Yeah, you know, unless something sneaky is going on beyond, you know, what I could catch here is, it basically says, um, we'll go back, So I'm sort of jumping in. An employer may not discriminate against a person in hiring, termination, or imposing any term or condition of employment or otherwise penalize a person based upon either the status of the person as a medical marijuana licensee holder or the results of a drug test showing positive for marijuana or its components. That's the way this law reads. And the way 788 read was, um, employers may not take action against the holder of a medical marijuana license solely based on the status of an employee as a medical marijuana license holder or the results of a drug test showing positive for marijuana as components. Same wording, basically. The only difference is that in this version, they enumerate it one, two, whereas in the previous version, it's written in as a, in, within a paragraph. Okay. All right, before just, we go on any farther, is, is there any way you could turn down a little bit of your light? Your face is white. Like white it out, almost can't yeah, even I see the facial to... hair. You're so white. How's that? that? That's better. That's better. You're still a little white, but that's a lot better than it was. So. Kind yeah. Of blurry, though. Kind of blurry. Well, uh, hang on a second. Let me just. Maybe it's my glasses. Let me clean my glasses. Oh. <laughs> All right, everybody, if you're watching, please like and share this. Okay, we need to. We we need okay. as many people as possible to hear this. So just take a second and share it. Again, we are talking about House Bill 2779 uh, by Olson. Now, I haven't looked up his info yet. We need to um, and post that. We need to get Jim everyone Olson. to call. We do need some action taken on this. We do need, I think, some people to call and express uh, some disagreement with this. Now, where I was headed with this earlier, why I brought the safety sensitive job, wasn't necessarily to go over the part of the bill that had that, although we need to or that talked about jobs, uh, although we need to, but it was to um, mention something we talked about before and something, a conclusion you came to in, in that first article you wrote for Extract, that incredible article that, in my opinion, was some of the best writing I've heard to explain where we're at and why we're where we're at. Um, you talked in that article about 
the the mindset of some of these people of the mm -hmm. with the safety sensitive jobs it's it's a it's a uh, the litmus test here is if you use cannabis you're a, a an immoral person right um, and so now we see the churches saying we don't want cannabis within a thousand feet and we're the we're the moral center of the state so I, I see these as as similar issues to you and and do you think this is some of the same oh yeah that's is right this like this I the said same religion? Right. is this right is this the same Essen group? essentially what this is is you know this is as I see it a violation of the establishment clause this is saying here's a here is our attitude right as persons of faith we think this is objectionable I bet you if you went to a synagogue and you asked them would you oppose there being a cannabis dispensary within a thousand feet of your synagogue they'd go no right you know it's like you know maybe if it was like immediately next door and it smelled maybe but you know if it's just two stores away and you don't get a smell it's whatever right and part of the reason why of course is because the jewish attitude towards cannabis is radically different than the most than, what is than that explain but we as the cannabis community we hear a lot about how uh, the u.s has paid for research that's been being done since the 70s in israel on cannabis Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, this was, we all learned a lot about this last year when, when pushing 788, winning class. So, um, uh, so tell me, what, what is the view, the Jewish view on, on cannabis and, and how is that different? So, first of all, cannabis is referred to in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus. Um, in Hebrew, it's uh, cannabis, um, and that's the same as cannabis, right? It is the, the word that was used through the Near East. It appears in the Hebrew in the plural. So like in English, the end of a word, you know, when it's plural, it usually has an S, in it, S for it. And then in Hebrew, the plural can be, it depends on the, the word, but an M at the end. So it's cannabosum in, in Exodus. And so there's a list of all the ingredients that go into holy anointing oil. And one of those ingredients is cannabosum, right? Which is a number of um, stalks of cannabis. So anointing oil is composed in part of cannabis. Now, let me just make a little side note. What does the word Christ mean? You, you tell me. I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to answer the questions because I'll make a fool of myself. The anointed one. You're the the anointed here. one. Christ, right? Crystal. Okay. The anointed one. So what is what is Christ anointed with? Oil. And what's in the oil? Well, from what you're saying is cannabis. Again, don't, let's not, you explain. I'm not going to play right. guessing. So, you know, I'm digressing from I'll the Jewish wrong. story, but that the name of their religion, Christianity, right, refers uh -huh. to holy anointing oil, which contains cannabis. The name of their religion alludes to cannabis. Yeah. Okay. And they All don't right, so, see the irony in that. No, they don't. So cannabis had been used through the Near East all the way basically from Japan across through the Middle East and North Africa for thousands of years, thousands of years, all right? We're talking at least 5,000 years of recorded use of cannabis, archeological prior to that. It was a non-issue. It was just among the many other plants that people used for medicinal purposes and for religious or spiritual purposes, all right? It was never challenged as somehow morally inappropriate for almost the entirety of its historical use. So, like I said, it was one of the ingredients. Now, the reason why the modern Bible doesn't say when you open up, I think it's Exodus 30, why it doesn't say cannabis, it'll usually say calamus or something else. The reason why is because of the Greek translation, the Septuagint. So what is that? Third century BC translators, when they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, they got lots of stuff wrong. You know, they, they weren't scholars to the same extent that a, that a philologist would be nowadays, right? So they translated the best they could. The Greeks may not have been familiar that that table with cannabis. It was not like that big of a deal. It was just one of all the many, many, many plants 
well, what is this cannabis? I don't know. It sounds like calamus. Okay, must be that's what we mean by they must have meant by it, calamus. And so they write it down in the third century BC as calamus. But the Hebrew is cannabis. All right. So all the translations in Europe built upon the Vulgate, built upon the Septuagint, just iterate over that translation error. But the Hebrew Bible, it's cannabis. Now, cannabis is referred to in the Talmud as well. So, you know, in additional essential Jewish writings, cannabis is also discussed. It was not thought of as an immoral, immoral thing. In fact, you know, any moral issue regarding cannabis might have maybe started to manifest in the 16th century under the Catholic control of the Central America, but basically, it never had any moral status to it. And so in, in Judaism, for instance, Jews would, would use cannabis historically on, on, on Purim. It was like something that, you know, it wasn't as if it was a religious law to do so, but it was just, you know, so, a, kind of a custom for people. And in, in Israel, you know, as you point out, while the U.S. was funding, right, anti-cannabis um, research in the United States. The United States was also funding pro-cannabis research in Israel. Israel has had medical marijuana for about 30 years, right? Here in Oklahoma, where we're still battling over these little details, it's been legal in Israel for 30 years. It's been legal in, in Canada for 20 and years. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the U.S. has paid for a great deal of this research that's done in Israel. So during, yeah, we, certainly during the 70s and 80s, yes. So, so we pay for research where it's legal while we arrest people and condemn people in our own country. Yep, that's right. Is, National Institute is, of Health funded a lot of, the, a lot of the fundamental research that was done in Israel that established basically our understanding of the endocannabinoid system. Okay, so it sounds like with this bill and, and some of this religious education, which I could listen to all day, uh, uh, maybe I'll take one of your classes. Um, it sounds like perhaps what we're running up against here, would we could call the, uh, the Baptist wall at this point. Um, that would probably be the, the dominant religion uh, in Oklahoma that would be opposed to this, would you think? Or do you think it's that's, all? That's my guess. You know, I, I actually had, had lunch um, with the executive director of the Council on um, uh, Islamic American Relations uh, a few days ago, and cannabis mm -hmm. was brought up. And he basically said that, you know, at least from his perspective as a Muslim, um, its medical use is perfectly acceptable, right? You know, there's a difference when it comes to getting impaired, but for medical use, it's perfectly acceptable. And so, you know, why is there this opposition to it among Christians when Christianity itself has its roots in cannabis, in a sense? Well, you know, it's, there, it's, 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 it's basically coming out of the early 20th century, right? Abstinence, prohibition, right? This, this attitude, this attitude basically that intoxicants are morally bad and they just think about cannabis as nothing but that. Well, I think if everybody, uh, I don't know what to do other than to, to attack the problem with knowledge. So I think if everybody watching this and everybody shares this video, there's going to be, a, um, there's, there is probably now and going to be a lot more people that attend church that will see this and hear this, and perhaps what we have to do is start going into those churches that we already attend and start having these conversations. Perhaps it's a, it's a matter of no longer leaving that out of the Sunday discussion. Um, maybe that's a, an approach, because otherwise we're going to be fighting this Baptist wall at every turn. And I know I've got a lot of friends that, that, that go to Baptist church churches and I know I'm going to have stronger conversations with them about them having conversations at their church about this issue. I, I really think we need to, we, we've got to work on changing their mind. We can't just blow them off and ignore them. We need to go educate them. 
But now let me say sort of on the other side of that, we, we have some dispensaries that, you know, the way in which they present, like there was that one dispensary some months ago that had like topless bud tenders, right? Right. You know, and there are dispensaries that we obviously think of as, as not representing cannabis as a medical product, right? Right. And so just as, just as you would think that, you know, a, a church would say, we don't want a strip club near us, we don't want a dispensary that has topless bud tenders near us, right? right. So you can understand from their attitude that there, there's inappropriate conduct going on. It's not the cannabis, it's the other stuff. And I could understand them having that reservation, but that's not what this bill really is about. <coughs> what this bill is about, because that doesn't warrant banning outright all cannabis establishments near a church. What they're basically saying is, we are so offended by the existence of cannabis in our state that we want to keep it as far away as we can justify from, from our houses of worship because the mere sight of it is offensive. Now, to take offense at a plant God created that has healing properties that's been used for 5,000 years, that's mentioned in the Bible, this is Well, un this unfortunately, I don't, unfortunately, I don't think they're offended by the side of the plant so much as they're offended by the side of the people that just might consume the plant. Well, <laughs> well. Uh, what, what would Jesus say, right, about, you know, people who are consuming cannabis? Somebody who has medical needs, somebody who's maybe, somebody else who's poor, somebody who doesn't look the way they think the church might want somebody to look. Well, if it's just a matter of appearances, how they look physically, how can you judge a person, right? And if they're there using cannabis for recreational purposes, they have a medical card, they're using it for recreational purposes. Well, you know, Jesus turned water into wine, right? At a wedding, you know, despite what the Baptists think about alcohol, it doesn't seem like that's Jesus's attitude towards it. There's a place in life for impairing, you know, for intoxicants. So, you know, there's a lot that could be said if you think about, you know, the Gospels and what role cannabis plays in people's lives that from a Christian perspective shouldn't be inappropriate or offensive. And if they do feel, if they do feel that there's something unethical going on, maybe what they should be doing is they should be talking to these people rather than trying to ghettoize them. Yeah, and, and I would ask, I would ask them to ask themselves if this same cannabis was in a pill um, distributed by a pharmaceutical company and picked up and, and, you know, your doctor was writing it to one of your family members, but it was in a pill, would you then be okay with it? Is it just the distribution, the way it's consumed, that you don't, you don't like the no control of a third party controlling uh, what somebody consumes? Is that, I mean, there's really some, got to be some basic questions here you know god god doesn't make pills god makes plants yeah but they're you know they're not protesting they're not saying they don't want a pharmacy within a thousand feet of their school or their their church or any uh -huh. facility that's rented ever by a church yep so, what if it's you like know, you know, one of those one of those little storeroom places and they're storing some church records you can't have a dispensary near that either? Well, this look, just the idea of restricting dispensaries away from churches gives into this moral argument that there's something morally wrong with cannabis or cannabis users. So yeah. whether it's 50 feet or 500 feet um, or 1,000 feet or whatever, any restriction like that is in my opinion, just it's it's bigotry. It's bigotry. Cannabis Jim Crow. Yeah. So look, I'm I'm betting that you know some uh, some religious scholars in the in the Baptist community. Maybe I mean I know with what you do, you probably have friends in high places everywhere. Um, could we possibly? find somebody that uh, that might be willing to come on and and talk about why they feel this way and and see if we can maybe start to understand from their perspective what they think because I don't like 
necessarily assigning motives to everybody. I, I'd much rather hear it from them, but it's hard to when a bill looks like this. It's hard not well, to. You, you know, it, it might be worth reaching out um, to, say, uh, the Oklahoma Baptist, um, Baptist Messenger, people that work there perhaps might want to um, discuss this issue. And, you know, I, I personally don't know them, um, but nevertheless, uh, maybe, maybe Representative Olson, maybe meet with him. Yeah, definitely need to reach out to him. I'll probably send him an email this weekend, see if uh, he'd be willing to talk to us. Um, if not on camera, at least privately, so we can uh, try and understand what his objective is here and how far he thinks this will go. Because like you said, and like we talked about at the beginning, we still don't know yet know whether this thing has legs. Now, whether it does or not, I think we need to react, because if we don't react, then it will. I think it will grow legs, even if it doesn't have them. I think if the cannabis community doesn't stand up and make phone calls to the representatives um, and tell them that, that this won't work, that we don't like this, and uh, then I think it will get legs and we'll end up with this being a problem. I also think, as we were talking about earlier, that this could be a matter of shoot for the moon and settle for the clouds, meaning if this restriction would be, would be hitting the moon to them, Maybe they're really after something a little bit less, and we just don't know what that is yet because we're busy tied up with this. So, so that, that is a concern. Do, do cannabis dispensaries smell bad? Do they smell like cannabis? No, I shouldn't say bad. Some people like the smell of cannabis. Some of it smells good. So do, you, does cannabis, do dispensaries smell like cannabis? If you're standing outside a dispensary, do you smell cannabis? No. No. On occasion. Generally not. Uh, no, on occasion in a few places you might smell it inside if a lot of containers are getting opened um, because they have a lot of customers, but everything's in right. sealed containers. So, right, so they can't even say that because it smells so bad it has to be a thousand feet away. Right. So what, right. what's the logic for its distance? I think it's because they don't want to see us. Because they think of it as morally bad and so they think that they, you know, cannabis shouldn't be near places that are good. So they want to have places that are good sequestered from places that are bad. They don't want bad places and good places to be too close to one another. Because why? You know, it's again, it's like the safety sensitive jobs. It's, we're back to the um, we're still fighting reefer madness. We're still fighting. Those of us that understand that the, the sky doesn't fall when people consume cannabis are still fighting those that, that, that are in control, that have the, the, the reins, and believe it's the devil's lettuce. I, I really think that's it. We're still fighting that culture war. This, yeah, is, this is nothing this is less than a culture war. Right. What's that? This is an expression of it. And so what real public interest is there in this? is that, there, that there's a group of people who find it morally offensive, right? And they don't want to see it. Well, you know, there are people that used to find member of people still. There are, you know, racists out there. There are bigots of a thousand different stripes. We don't set into law saying, oh, gee, you know, these people are hate these people, so we have to pass laws to keep them a thousand feet from one another. That's what this is doing. Yeah. How do we have you a know, civil society? Unfortunately, some of these people look for ways to be offended. And what I mean by that as an example is a meeting we spoke at one time where the gentleman was so offended because of the advertising. He said everything was, was advertising to kids. He said you walk into a dispensary and everything looks pretty. It's all advertising to kids. Well, this is somebody who's obviously morally objects to cannabis going into a dispensary to find reasons to be offended. I mean, this is beyond normal thinking. And you remember, we spent a couple hours arguing with this person. It's, I don't know. I, I think people need to stop looking for reasons to be offended. And if they're going to find them, it shouldn't be cannabis. There's much worse and, things out there. And, and let's put it this way. You know, there, there can be things that are offensive within the world of cannabis, the topless bud tenders, right? 
So there can be things that, that are seen as offensive, but that doesn't mean cannabis is offensive, right? So you'd say, look, you know, imagine there's some company, Heinz Ketchup, and let's say Heinz Ketchup decides to come up with this advertising campaign, right, with vampires drinking ketchup or whatever, or something like this, and people found it inappropriate or offensive, too scary or who knows what, and so they, they stop the advertising campaign, right? They don't say, let's ban ketchup from the world. So, right, what they're doing is it's like, there can be offensive things. Well, you address them when they happen. But then to yeah, set up a law that says you can't have this business near this other establishment, you know, you know, yeah. it's like, are, are they snowflakes, so to speak, right? It's like they're so, you know, they're so morally vulnerable that if they walk out of their church after a wonderful sermon and then see a dispensary now down the street, they now feel, you know, like their their whole religiously edified moment has been decimated. Well, if they're, are they that vulnerable? Is their faith that weak, right? That they can't step out into the world Right, and see the variety beyond right the sphere that they're most comfortable in. We live in a pluralistic society. Do we start passing laws that say you can't have a mosque within a thousand feet of a church because some Christians find Muslims offensive? All very good points. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry about that. Well, Okay, we've beat this horse pretty hard. Uh, again, this is House Bill 2779 by Olson. I've not looked up his information yet. I will look up his information and yeah. post it I, in the... Yeah, I posted it on this a couple times. Jim Olson. Okay. Do it again. All right. Oh, and the, you posted it in the comments? You're saying you posted it in the comments? Yep, doing it again. Okay. All right, folks, he's got it in the comments. So look that up and let's all let Jim Olson know that um, that we think this is way off, way off base. And let's see if we can, what we can do to squash this before it gets any legs. I think you the know, arguments can be made that it's both un-American and un-Christian. Yeah. Last year, I know there was uh, roughly 3,000 bills filed by this date last year. And it was about 1,500 from the House and about 1,500 from the Senate. And so, and this is one that we've seen. So I'm, I, I think we should all be very mindful of this. We should be very vigilant about what's coming. If you haven't made a relationship with your representative yet, it's certainly time to do so. This session is right around the corner. They've all filed the bills with titles. That means everything they're working on has been laid out there for us to look at. What we have to do is help them figure out the right way to go about it and be careful of the amendments and other stuff they will hide in there. Um, you know, that's that's where they get us. And, and I see this kind of like that. I mean, why does this address, I'm not sure why this addresses the jobs issue and that. Yeah, I don't understand why they decided to uh, add that in, maybe as a, as a red herring to distract us, I don't know. Um, yeah. So I'm curious as to whether this bill is a pawn or a king in the game of chess. It may just be a pawn, so, but it's going to be a king if we don't, or at least a rook, if we don't react and make some phone calls. Let them know uh, what we think about this. Check the bill out, read it. We'll post a link to that also, and uh, everybody check it out. All right, well, what else you want to talk about? Just one thing, I'm looking at it again, and there, there is a, maybe a little bit of substantive change in the employer language. It used to say employers may not take action against, and now it says an employer may not discriminate, discriminate against. Anyhow, I'll have to think about whether there's a substantive change in that from take action against to discriminate against. Hmm. But okay. again, so back, back, to the, um, uh, back to the religion issue, you know, somebody could say, look, this doesn't violate the First Amendment because it's not about one specific religion. It, it mentions churches, mosques, synagogues, and so on. It mentions them all. But the point is, is that this is something that's coming out of a Christian sentiment. 
not a Jewish sentiment, right? So maybe they're saying, well, we want to protect Jews against synagogue against dispensaries as well. So we're going to not even let them near be near near synagogues. Well, you know, they're basically again saying that they want the state, they want the state government, right, to reflect this Christian sentiment against cannabis. So what you're saying is, by the way this is, the fact that the the, the synagogues would not be against uh, a dispensary nearby, and that this includes the synagogues, that therefore that shows this is another religion pushing this moral objection. Well, what I'm what I'm saying is is that the argument might be used. Olson might use the argument like this doesn't doesn't violate the First Amendment because it doesn't pertain to any specific religion. It's for all religions, all houses of worship. But then my rebuttal to that is it says, look, the reason why you are concerned with keeping them away from all houses of worship is because of the particular religion that you have. Now, right. other That's religions. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Right, right. So synagogues, you know, depends, right, on the synagogue. But, you know, there's Orthodox Jews, conservatives, Reformed Jews who use cannabis, who use cannabis on poor, right, who, who see cannabis as part of, like, the, the, one of the largest cannabis companies in the world, Tikkun Olam, from Israel, right? Tikkun Olam is the mission of all Jews to basically, it's, it's translates to repair the world. And that's the name of a cannabis company that was created by Orthodox Jews, right? This tells you how different cannabis is seen by Jews than, than Christians. Right. So the fact that, that they want to ban dispensaries near all houses of worship is not something that a Jew would be promoting. Okay, so we need to work on our Christian brothers and sisters. We've got some work to do here. I think it's time to start having some conversations with some heads of some churches. Um, you know, I know so many people that go to church that are card holders, but would never dare bring it up in church. And I think maybe this attitude is not going to change until they do. So I think everybody's going to need to do their part here. It's going to take all of us. Can I read you a, a, a passage from Ecclesiasticus? Of course. Let me just load it up again. So, Ecclesiasticus 38.4, King James Version translation. The Lord hath created medicines out of the earth, and he that is wise will not abhor them. Who Very finds relevant. cannabis abhorrent? Very relevant. That's a None that's a good one wise. to end that topic on. All right. <clears throat> well, you know, I, I don't know. We need to light this guy's phone up, and we need to go start talking to our churches. It's time to start having some conversations. What else you want to talk about before we wrap this up? We are coming up on an hour. We're already at almost 50 minutes. Yeah, I can just reiterate the fact, how is the Church of Cannabis going to be able to practice? It's not. We, we've already determined that. They won't. It'll be illegal to be a Church of Cannabis. Well, which, almost. You know, they which, would could make... be the, which, which could be part of the objective here. Is this a pawn? Is this a king? Does this have legs? Does it not? The one we Church of Cannabis, yeah, the one Church of Cannabis in Oklahoma that I visited is run out of a dispensary because right. the dispensary owner sees cannabis as having religious significance and he conducts his services out of his own place of business. And that would, you and eat. this would make that illegal. Now, you you know, now we want to see a violation of the first amendment. There you go. You, uh, you gave a sermon there, correct? I gave a couple sermons there. Yeah. A couple sermons there. Okay. All right. So, and under this bill, that would be illegal. Yep. That's not good. That's not going to fly. That, yeah, that, even if that was to pass, that would be challenged in court. I have no doubt. So, but and once I again, think there, it, there are dozens of cannabis churches around the country. Yeah. You yeah. know, well, this, this, this place in Oklahoma City is not unique. I think it's going to be up to all of us to, look, it's going to be up to all of us to, to really, to make our voices heard on this. It's not going to go away on its own. We are in the buckle of the Bible belt. Um, if we don't do anything about this, nobody will. 
And and again, I say 3,000 bills. This is one. So is this a pawn? Is this a rook? I don't know yet. But we got to start looking through those other bills because there's going to be a lot more stuff like this that we're going to need to expose and we're going to need to get involved in helping stop or adjust or whatever happens. And the ones that we support, we need to help get across the finish line. So get some relationships with your lawmakers. I, I, I'm just going to put up something else here on the uh, comment thread, which is a link to uh, my column that you mentioned earlier from last month. That yeah, that's speaks a great to one. The level of bigotry that that still right dominates this state. And and I have another I have another uh, column that comes out next week on Wednesday, uh, but this one is from November, and I, I if time allows I'm going to be do, I'm going to be doing one monthly. Okay, that's great. And if you guys go to that website and you don't have the time to read it or don't want to read it, Lawrence reads it to you on the show, which is also on that website. So look under at the OKCLA. No, You've got it up there. Not on the link you? that I just put up, though. Not on the link I just put up. Well, but the link is going to take him to the to the different link. But let me put up that link. Oh, that's not going to take him to the. Okay, well, look, let's just do this. OKCLA dot org. There you go, folks. Go to that right there, and uh, where'd it go? There it is, and. You can see the video of him reading it. And you've got it posted there too, don't you? Yeah, I put it up on that. So okay, I, we need some more traffic on our website. I think I just put up the link that you're mentioning, Chris, to the um, to that time where you wanted me to read it on the show. Yeah. I think that's it. All right. Well, it's going to be a, a crazy year. There's a lot coming up. Um, Everybody knows we've been working on moving the state forward in the future and stopping things like this is part of that. So get involved, Send, go to the website, okcla.org, send us an email, you'll get a response back from Amy. Amy's been doing a great job of keeping up with everybody um, and she'll put you on a list. Uh, if you don't know your representatives, we'll help you figure out how to figure out who they are and help you in figuring out what to say when you call them. Maybe, Lawrence, maybe this weekend we can write a little something and put up there for suggestions on what they say when they call, and maybe we can get his phone lit up by Monday. So That's a good idea. Yeah. It's time for I, you to I think put... that'll get... Go ahead. Your sound is... Where's your sound? Here. Oh, Sorry. there it is. All right. Okay. I think I hit my mute button. I think it may have actually been me. Yeah. I update the OKCLA website every couple weeks, and I will add this to it. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up, if that's good for you, Lawrence. Do you see any questions on here we need to get to right away? I see a lot of people have opinions. That's great. We have questions. Let's see. Okay, Sue, so, uh, we're not assuming they're for or against. We're talking about where the uh, idea behind this bill might be coming from. Okay, all right, well, we'll keep chatting with everybody. Um, all right, I think that's about it, Lawrence. Something you want to, anything you want to end with? No, no, time for me. I think I'm going to just lay down and watch uh, season four of The Expanse came out today. Of what? The Expanse. Adam which Hole, one's that? his favorite show too. It's which, a science fiction show based upon a series of novels, uh, Leviathan's Wake. It's it's a good show. I'll have it's to no check Star it out. It's no Star Trek, but still. Oh, oh, so you were a Trekkie, or you are a Trekkie? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we won't hold that. We love you anyway, Lawrence. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up. the force be with you. That's, yeah, okay. My bad joke. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, this being the weekend, the last Star Wars coming out, uh, good time for it. All right, folks. Well, that's going to be it, I guess. Uh, we'll go live again in a few days, and uh, who knows? 
we'll do something else. Uh, my The cooking show the other day is not quite done being edited. Hoping it'll be done in a few days. That was a lot of fun, cutting down about two or three hours into about 30 minutes. So that was a lot of fun, and I'm hoping to do that again soon. Chris Powell is coming by tomorrow. I think I'm going to run out and get some stuff we can grill up for lunch while he's here, and we'll talk politics and go live and make some food. So there you go. Going to be a busy weekend. All right, Lawrence. I guess that's it. Okay, folks. Until next time. Stay grumpy, and we will see you on the road.